Professor Abbas. So I will hand over the chairmanship to the Professor Gazinian. Hasmik, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Let us move to the Puzzle School Hepatology CSC session seven, titled uh, uh, Hepatopulmonary Syndrome and uh, Portopulmonary Hypertension. My pleasure to introduce first speaker, Professor Valentin Farman. Professor Valentin uh, Farman uh, studied medicine in the uh, Medical University in Vienna, Austria. He uh, obtained his medical training as gastroenterologist and in the intensivist uh, at the Medical University of Vienna, Austria, and in uh, Germany. His main research is organ crosstalk with a special focus on uh, liver-lanka interactions. Professor Fama published more than 100 PubMed cited articles. He is a deputy chair of the section Metabolics, Endocrinology, Nutrition and Liver of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, head of the section Gastroenterology of the German Society and Medical Intensive Care, deputy chair of the section Intensive Care of the German Society uh, of Gastroenterology, and deputy chair of the section Liver Viola of the German Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Professor Farman is director of uh, the Department of Medicine uh, uh, One um, Evangelist Clinicum uh, Niederland, Germany. Please, Professor uh, Farman. Yeah, dear ladies and gentlemen, good day, good evening from Germany, Europe. I'm very proud and happy mm -hmm. to have the possibility to, to contribute to this School of Hepatology and to give a talk, a lecture regarding uh, my algorithmic approach to management of hepatopulmonary syndrome. Um, I have no conflict of interest in this field and I want to talk about causes of respiratory insufficiency in cirrhosis, the examination in patients with suspicion of HPS and therapeutic options in patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome. So basically, respiratory insufficiency is frequent in liver diseases and more than 50% of patients with cirrhosis have an increased AAPO2 and more than 30% of patients undergoing evaluation of liver transplantation suffer from shortness of breath. There is a huge variety, variety of causes of respiratory insufficiency in liver disease, and I divided this in three subgroups, primary pulmonary causes, cardiac causes, and extrathoracic causes. In the subgroups, uh, the pulmonary causes, we have several subgroups. The most frequent causes are alterations of the pulmonary vasculature, mainly hepatopulmonary syndrome that is observed in 20 to 30% of patients with liver, chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. Thereafter, portopulmonary hypertension, for sure, will focus on hepatopulmonary symptoms. But we have also to consider that there are other, other alterations of the lung parenchyma, like COPD, pneumonitis, or uh, pneumonia, or alteration of the pleura and diaphragma, like hepatic hydrothorax, for instance. Otherwise, several cardiac causes can contribute to this uh, to respiratory insufficiency, like cardiac insufficiency, valvular arrhythmic heart diseases, and others. And for sure, extrathoracic causes can contribute to respiratory insufficiency, mainly ascites or also obesity are frequent causes. This is a couple of Meyer plots assessing. Uh, 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 one year survival in patients with cirrhosis that are all liver transplant candidates. And you see here several groups, group one to five. There's an uh, older uh, uh, study that I did in Vienna, uh, Austria. And we had one subgroup of patients with significantly increased mortality rates within one year. Um, and this was the group with patients with severe hypoxemia, independently of the cause. That means severe hypoxemia and cirrhosis contributes to significantly increased mortality rates independent of the cause. Therefore, we have to focus on this important issue. I want to start with my case presentation. Patient was referred to the outpatient clinics due to dyspnea. It's a 53-year-old female Caucasian um, um, with an alcoholic liver cirrhosis uh, known for seven months. And since diagnosis, she uh, stopped drinking alcohol. 
uh, abdominal ultrasound revealed typical signs of cirrhosis, previously performed upper GI endoscopy revealed signs of portal hypertension. A patient was treated on the presentation with a non-selective beta blocker, lactulose and spironolactone, and uh, had no ascites. Lab assessment revealed um, creatinine of 1.2, bilirubin of 2.6 milligram per deciliter, um, no signs of acute infection, INR was 1.3, MELT score 15 points, check PUKE class B, 9 points. And um, from the clinical point of view, we have always to consider the different forms that, mentioned, that I mentioned previously that contribute to dyspnea. That's a leading symptom, but it's not specific. As you know, it can be caused by hepatopulmonary syndrome, pneumonia, CBD, ascites, and others. We have also always considered the medical history of previously pulmonary diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and the medical condition. Is there an acute infection? Is there fluid retention, for instance, a consequence of acute kidney injury or something else? In detail, regarding the dyspnea, we focused in the physical examination, also in clinical signs. We observed cyanosis and digital clubbing as illustrated here in this uh, picture on the right. We observed spider nevi and diffuse telangiectasia and clinical signs of so-called platypnea. That means worsening of dyspnea by moving the patient from the supine to the upright position. This is found in about 25% of patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome. It's not specific. It can be also observed in patients with cardiovascular diseases like patent forum and ovale, for instance, but it's also frequently observed in advanced hepatopulmonary syndrome. Otherwise, you can always also observe, and I want to introduce this term, autodeoxia. That means quite a comparable situation. It means a decrease of PO2 of more than 5% or more than four millimeters of mercury by moving from the supine to the upright position. Sometimes you can observe in patients with HPS also significant sleep time, oxygenation, desaturation, and um, interesting, HPS is less common in smokers. In our patient that performed a pulse oximetry that revealed um, an uh, oxygen saturation of 90 Two percent that is decreased. Many authors recommend pulse oximetry as a um, screening tool for hepatopulmonary syndromes. Usually, a cutoff of SeO2 below 96 percent is recommended. However, um, recent studies revealed that pulse oximetry may not be the optimal screening tool for HPS as it is insensitive for detection of HPS. It has a high specificity but the sensitivity is very low. And therefore, in the last years, many authors recommend arterial blood glucose analysis as mandatory to detect um, a severe, uh, detect an uh, increased AAPO2 and oxygen insufficiency and recommends not to use SAO2 furthermore as screening tool. However, I'm aware that a lot of uh, uh, physicians still use it as screening tool, but you have to consider the limitations of its low sensitivity. Furthermore, you have to exclude other uh, pulmonary diseases. So usually we perform a chest imaging, uh, chest X-ray. Um, in our patient, we had a normal uh, finding, but you can observe something pleural effusion, typical right-sided, for instance, by hepatic hydrothorax or pneumonia or even pneumothorax. In some cases, you always have to consider a necessity of CT scan because um, also pulmonary embolism and uh, may be present um, um, and, uh, as you are as you all know that um, thrombo, thrombosis and thromboembolism is almost twofold increased in patients with chronic liver disease and also cirrhosis. After we performed respiratory function testing, um, as usually in patients with uh, uh, liver diseases, lung volumes are normal. However, um, um, in up to 20% reduction of forced vital capacity or FEV1 is observed, for instance, as a consequence of COPD or restricted lung disease, ascites, and so on. So therefore, we need pulmonary function testing on the one hand to assess gas exchange and on the other hand to exclude uh, other uh, potential diagnosis of respiratory insufficiency. If you do advanced pulmonary function testing, you can also assess the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide that is frequently reduced in patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome. In our case, pulmonary function testing was normal. However, arterial blood gas analysis revealed severe hypoxemia with a PO2 level of 55 millimeters of mercury and a significantly increased AAPO2. 
after we performed a transthoracic echocardiography just as ejection fraction, but the heart disease and also um, signs of right uh, heart impairments. I think the, the next talk will focus on this issue. And I will focus on this issue. We performed also a so-called transthoracic contrast enhanced echocardiography for detection of intrapulmonary vasodilation. In this case, we use agitated saline to create micro bubbles with a diameter of more than 10 micrometers. And normally these micro bubbles do not pass the pulmonary capillary bed. Um, however, in case of interpulmonary vascular dilatation that is present in hepatopulmonary syndrome, these micro bubbles pass the intravascular pulmonary bed and appear in the left heart um, after more than three heartbeats. And here this graph demonstrates the appearance of the micro bubbles in the right atrium. And after more than three heartbeats, in this case, four heartbeats, also the appearance in the left atrium. And this is a typical sign of intrapulmonary vascular dilatation. In contrast, the intracardiac shunting, you have an immediate appearance of the micro bubbles in the left heart after appearance in the right heart. So, you, so that's how you differentiate interpulmonary from intracardiac shunting. Here is a life. Uh, here is an, 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 an loop to illustrate this in in, 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 in in action. However, just consider this is a transesophageal echocardiography. But here is the right heart. Here is the left heart. You see the appearance of the microbiome in the right heart, and after more than three heartbeats, also in the left heart. That's a huge amount of interpulmonary shunting with in a patient with severe HPS. This patient had also uh, PO2 levels uh, below, I think, below even 50 millimeters of mercury. Um, alternatively, you can also use radionuclide lung perfusion techniques um, with agitated macrogated albumin particle technetium labeled. The advantage is that you can um, um, also quantify the shunt volume. However, you cannot uh, differentiate or distinct intracardiac from interpulmonary shunting. And this is, has a high specificity, but a less uh, lower sensitivity than contrast enhanced echocardiography. So usually we use contrast enhanced echocardiography for detection of intrapulmonary vascular dilatation. And this is the gold standard. This is the diagnostic criteria for presence of hepatopulmonary syndrome. First, presence of liver disease, acute or chronic. Second, gas exchange abnormality with AAPU2 above 15 millimeters of mercury or 20 in older patients above 40, 64 years of age. And third, presence of intrapulmonary vasodilatation, usually diagnosed by positive contrast enhanced echocardiography. Um, so I conclude our patient is a patient with cirrhosis and dyspnea. We excluded intrinsic cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases. The patient suffered from severe hypoxemia, PA2 of 5, 55 millimeters of mercury, and had the presence of interpulmonary vascular dilatation detected by contrast intense echocardiography. So therefore, we established a diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome, and you can grade the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome by cutoffs of PA2 mild, PA2 above 80 millimeters of mercury, moderate 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury PO2, severe HPS PO2 below 60 millimeters of mercury. And some uh, uh, people also uh, established the diagnosis of very severe HPS with uh, PO2 levels below 50 millimeters of mercury. So in our case, patient with severe hepatopulmonary syndrome. Um, this is so an example of, of a study that assessed patients with transplant candidates for presence of liver uh, for, for hepatopulmonary syndrome. About 30% of these patients had hepatopulmonary syndrome, and about 10% of the patients with HPS suffer from severe HPS, that means PO2 below 60 millimeters of mercury. So this is not so a rare condition. However, importantly, most of the data is derived from experience centers that are focused on detection and uh, treatment um, um, of hepatopulmonary syndrome. There's a recent American study, and I think it's quite interesting because it illustrates the real life data of management and detection of hepatopulmonary syndrome. It's a retrospective review of um, um, uh, a US-based multi-state health system, including liver transplant centers between 2014 and 2019, with more than 40,000 patients with cirrhosis, and surprisingly, only less than 200 patients had the coded diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome. That means 0.45%. And by going into detail in this population, out of this uh, 200 patients, only in less than 80% transthoracic contrast echocardiography was performed. 
And only in about 50% of these patients, interpulmonary vasodilatation was detected. That means that almost 50% of these patients with diagnosis of HPS in the system did not suffer from HPS. And furthermore, only in uh, 20% arterial blood gas analysis was available in combination with interpulmonary vasodilatation. So uh, in the real life settings, the diagnostic procedure is usually not uh, performed. And this study, I think, highlights the need for improved education as performed in this uh, webinar and more effective screening algorithm, algorithms in the real life setting for diagnosis and the after therapy of hepatopulmonary syndrome. Because hepatopulmonary syndrome contributes to significantly increased mortality rates in patients with cirrhosis, as several studies demonstrate, demonstrated. An American study demonstrated an almost 2.5 fold increased mortality in patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome, and the natural cause of disease. Hepatopulmonary syndrome is a progressive disease um, um, with a deterioration of PO2 of five millimeters of mercury per year. That's a dramatic deterioration per year. Um, that's even a, strong, a stronger deterioration compared to patients with COPD. So this is an active progressive disease. We have to consider this in our daily management. Otherwise, interesting, after normalization of liver function, hepatopulmonary syndrome reverses. Um, we could demonstrate this in a group of patients with acute, kind of acute liver failure. Um, these seven patients had uh, all hepatopulmonary syndrome with uh, dyspnea and, and uh, uh, positive contrast and sense echocardiography after normalization of liver function uh, of the follow-up of almost so three weeks, uh, three months, sorry. Um, oxygenation improved and contrast and sense echo was negative in every patient after normalization of liver disease. So this is a potential reversible uh, disease. So going to therapies, what are our therapeutic options? On the one hand, we have the opportunity of supportive treatment, uh, mainly supplemental oxygen therapy, and on the other hand, liver transplantation. I will also give an overview over the medical therapeutic options. TIPS improves portal hypertension, but usually it does not improve the gas exchange and is not a therapeutic option for treatment of hepatopulmonary syndrome per se. Interpulmonary coiling of the interpulmonary vasodilatations is only useful in patients with localizable intrapulmonary shunting. However, in HPS, usually interpulmonary vasodilatation is diffuse, and a diffuse shunting is not uh, successfully treated by uh, interpulmonary coiling. So going back to our case, we, you remember severe hypoxemia, PO2 of 55 millimeters of mercury. The recommendation by the Liver Transplant Society guidelines is um, use supplemental oxygen therapy in, if PO2 is below 60 millimeters of mercury. We did this in our patient, and there are also some interesting reports. For instance, this is another case report published several years ago of a 60 three-year-old female with HCV cirrhosis, with child C cirrhosis and severe hepatopulmonary syndrome, um, who improved also her liver function after initiation of oxygen therapy to child, child A cirrhosis. So I think that the uh, optimization of the gas exchange may also contribute to an improvement of hepatic function. However, the main cause of treatment is liver transplantation. There are several reports that transplantation uh, improves gas exchange uh, 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 by increasing PO2 and, and decreasing AAPO2. Um, during transplantation, you have always the, the main discussion with the colleagues from the uh, anesthesiological department, have, what do we have to consider? Will this patient suffer from severe hypoxemia during transplantation? And usually you can say no. In average, the median duration of mechanical ventilation or in severe HPS after the liver transplantation is only one day. However, there can be a huge range in individual basis. And the median duration of supplemental oxygen therapy after liver transplantation is so four to six months usually, and thereafter, patients significantly improve. And the first data several years ago demonstrated significantly improved mortality rates uh, uh, after transplantation in hepatopulmonary syndrome. That led to MELD exception policy in severe HPS, that means PO2 below 60 meters of mercury in Europe, in US, um, and, and after criteria of severe hepatopulmonary syndrome is established, liver disease, PO2 below 60, proof of interpulmonary shunting, um, in several, many countries, uh, uh, exceptional MELD points were given and were upgraded repeatedly during follow-up 
Um, the best data of delivered transportation is provided by the UNOS data uh, from our colleagues from the United States. There are two main studies, one uh, 10 years and one almost 20 years, and uh, they, ex they demonstrated an excellent outcome of patient with liver transplantation, HPS, across the whole pre-transplant PO2 spectrum, also patients with severe HPS, this PO2 levels below 45 millimeters of mercury had benefited from liver transplantation and had a long-term outcome, median survival of more than 10 years. That's really an impressive uh, improvement of outcome. Our patient uh, was evaluated for liver transplantation and was included on the waiting list for liver transplantation, received med exception policy in HPS. Um, we monitored the gas exchange every three months. They were stable with initiation of supplemental oxygen, and the patient was finally transplanted nine months after listing for liver transplantation. Um, mechanical ventilation was, in our case, necessary for two days following liver transplantation, and follow-up was uh, without uh, big complications. Supplemental oxygen therapy could be stopped after five months following liver transplantation, and finally, and in contrast, enhanced echocardiography will no signs of inter pulmonary vasodilatation nine months after liver transplantation. However, there can be several cases of severe hypoxemia after liver transplantation, um, and many risk factors are severe hypoxemia prior to liver transplantation, PO2 below 50 millimeters of mercury, and a significantly increased interpulmonary shunting of more than 20%. And this occurs in about 10 to 20 percent um, severe hypoxemia after liver transplantation of patients with severe HPS and is associated with increased mortality rates. However, as you are all aware, uh, ICU has a lot of op treatment opportunities in the patients, and there are several, system, several reports, and there's a recent systematic review that demonstrated seven cases with ECMO uh, in patients with HPS, mainly following liver transplantation. The median duration of necessity of mainly venous ECMO was two weeks, and impressively, 82% of the patients survived to hospital discharge. So in the meantime, we have really the opportunity also to uh, bridge these severely impaired patients after liver transplantation by massive uh, ICU support to uh, frequently recovery. Medical therapies. There's only a short issue because I only illustrate the, the clinical uh, studies because there's no proven medical therapy for treatment of hepatopulmonary syndromes. Several uh, studies with small group of patients were performed to improve the vascular tone and to decrease the interpulmonary vas vascular dilatation. Also, some promising case reports uh, uh, suggested potential improvement. Case series could not observe any improvement in gas exchange or reduction in interpulmonary shunting. Other studies using antibiotics like norfloxacin or pentoxifilin did not observe um, an improvement of uh, interpulmonary shunting or gas exchange uh, after promising experimental data that reported improvement um, of these uh, parameters by treatment of bacterial translocation and endotoxemia and uh, reduction of pulmonary monocyte infiltration. And finally, there is a study with 30 patients assessing the uh, effects of sorafenib uh, on interpulmonary arterial shunt formation. However, in this study, no improvement of gas exchange, no improvement of shunting could be observed. Um, there was a worse quality of life in the group of patients that received sorafenib. So therefore, currently, no medical treatment is available for uh, advanced hepatopulmonary syndrome. So I conclude. Respiratory insufficiency is common in patients with liver diseases and is associated with increased mortality rates. Hepatopulmonary syndrome is the most frequent pulmonary complication of cirrhosis. It is a progressive disease. It is associated with more than 2.5 fold increased mortality rates in cirrhosis, and it is reversible after normalization of the liver function. Um, therapeutic options in hepatopulmonary symptoms are liver transplantation with consecutive stepwise resolution of hepatopulmonary syndrome and supplemental oxygen therapy in patients with severe HPS, that means PO2 levels below 60 millimeters of mercury. And the right side uh, illustrates my approach, my diagnostic approach to patients with chronic liver disease and dyspnea. I perform arterial blood gas analysis and in patients with an increased APO2, I perform a contrast enhanced echocardiography to detect interpulmonary vasodilatation. And thereafter, I stratify according to the PO2, patients with PO2 levels 
above 60 milliliters of mercury, I perform close follow-up because I know it's a progressive disease and in patients with peer with below 60 milliliters of mercury, I initiate long-term oxygen therapy and evaluate the patients for liver transplantation only to the presence of hepatopulmonary syndrome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Farman, for your excellent presentation. Uh, now, uh, my co-moderator uh, will introduce second speaker, please, uh, Professor Zaigam. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Lauren Seville. And Professor Seville is from Department of Pulmon uh, Pulmonology and ICU. National Reference Center for Pulmonary Hypertension, uh, South Paris University, Bositer Hospital, La Kremlin, uh, Bositer, France. He has more than 350 publications uh, uh, to his credit, and his main area of research is pulmonary hypertension, lung transplantation, and congenital photosystemations. So he would be discussing uh, now on my algorithm approach to the management of portopulmonary hypertension. Over to Professor Seville. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. And it's a pleasure to, to speak now about the portopulmonary hypertension that is the other pulmonary vascular complication of patient with portal hypertension. So just to introduce the subject, you can see that the a distribution of the pulmonary vascular resistance in patients with portal hypertension is different that we can observe in a healthy subject. And most often patients develop high cardiac output and low level of pulmonary vascular resistance. But paradoxically, we can observe in some patients an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance that is due to a pulmonary vascular remodeling of the small pulmonary arteries. So finally, you will define a portal pulmonary hypertension by the combination of portal hypertension, whatever the mechanisms, extrahepatic portal hypertension, intrahepatic portal hypertension, or portosystemic shunts associated with the definition of precapillary pulmonary hypertension that recently changed. And now you have to consider that this patient have a, a, a pulmonary hypertension if the mean pulmonary pressure is higher than 20 millimeter of mercury with a normal postcapillary pressure and a level of pulmonary vascular resistance higher than two wood units. So the definition is a nemodynamic definition, and that's why we will see that the weight of catheterization is essential to establish a diagnosis of portopulmonary hypertension. Regarding the prevalence of portopulmonary hypertension is less frequent than uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome with a prevalence between two to 6% of patients according to the studies, the type of population, and the definition of pulmonary hypertension. That is very important is that these pulmonary vascular complications can develop in all patients, whatever the severity of the underlying liver disease and whatever the mechanisms of the portal hypertension. So the POPH have a real impact on the survival of patients with cirrhosis. In this uh, French cohort of patients, more than 600 patients with estimate the survival of patients at 50% uh, at five years. You can see that the severity of pulmonary hypertension can have an impact on the survival of patients, but more important is the severity of the underlying liver disease. A patient who combine a severe cirrhosis and portal and portal pulmonary hypertension have a, a rate of death that is higher than 50% at one year. So that's why it's very important to consider that the management of these patients should be based on a multidisciplinary approach that can induce early detections, accurate diagnosis to propose the best management of these patients to improve the survival of patients who develop portopulmonary hypertension. So three uh, main points, we will discuss three main points. First, the screening of portopulmonary hypertension, the medical management of these patients, and the role of liver transplantation in the management of portopulmonary hypertension. Uh, 
Regarding the clinical case, we have a 48 years old man. These patients have a HGV cirrhosis, like base stage B, made uh, 12, and he has an active esophageal bleeding with an indication for early tips. So the first question is, is there an indication for PUPH screening? So the PUPH screening uh, must be proposed in all patients who are candidate for liver transplantation and all patients candidate for an antihepatic portosystemic shunt because uh, the diagnosis of PH in these patients can have a major impact on the management of these patients and the survival of these patients. So that's why it's very important to systematically screen the portopulmonary hypertension in all these candidates because portopulmonary hypertension can be a contraindication for the TIPS and can be a contraindication for liver transplantation if pH is not managed before. For the other patients, it is not recommended to screen systematically portopulmonary hypertension in all patients with cirrhosis, but you have to screen portopulmonary hypertension if patients have uh, unexplained dyspnea, syncope, fluid retention not explained by the severity of the liver disease or elevation of the cardiac biomarkers. For the screening of portopulmonary hypertension, the echocardiography is recommended to, to, for the screening and uh, the echocardiography will assess the probability of pulmonary hypertension, but it's not a definitive diagnosis. So you have to base on the level of the tricuspid regurgitation velocity, and you have also to describe the morphologic uh, the difference change in the white cavities, the white ventricular function, and the white ventricle pulmonary artery coupling. And with all these uh, parameters, you will define if patients have a low probability, intermediate probability, or high probability of pulmonary arterial hypertension. If the tricuspid regurgitation velocity is lower than 2.8, with no indirect signs of pulmonary hypertension, the probability is low, and you can uh, you, you can stop here the investigation. But if patients have a VRT lower than 2.8 with indirect signs of pulmonary hypertension or a level of VRT between 2.9 and 3.4, you want to consider that there is an intermediate probability of pulmonary hypertension. And with patients with a VRT higher than 3.44, you have to consider that there is a high probability of pulmonary hypertension. So for uh, our patients, uh, the echocardiography show a tricuspid regurgitation velocity at uh, 3.6 with pulmonary arter artery dilatation. And you can see uh, that on the imaging uh, exam with also a white ventricle uh, dilation. So finally, these patients have a high probability of pulmonary hypertension. And for all these patients, you have to refer this patient in an expert center to have an hemodynamic assessment. And you have also to consider that white heart catheterization uh, must be performed in all patients with intermediate probability, because if you have a diagnosis of POPH, there is a very important impact on the management of patients. So the white hot gas is mandatory to uh, definitively uh, have, a, uh, have the, a diagnosis of portopulmonary hypertension. And uh, the interpretation of hemodynamic is very important because many uh, processes can uh, increase the pulmonary pressure in these patients and you can have a passive elevation of pulmonary pressure due to the hyperdynamic status that is frequent in these patients and volume overload. But in these patients, the pulmonary vascular resistance will be normal or low. And in contrast, patients with pulmonary vascular uh, remodeling, you uh, will observe a progressive increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance that will define uh, the portopulmonary hypertension. And some patients will have a combination of 
uh, hyperdynamic status with early POPH. And that's why even if the PVR is between two and three wood units, you have considered that these patients have an early pulmonary vascular disease and you have to closely follow up uh, these patients because we know that these patients will develop higher level of PVR uh, during the follow-up period. So her patients had uh, hemodynamic assessments with the white heart catheterizations. This patient has a dyspnea, moderate dyspnea uh, functional class two uh, with a near normal six minute walk distance. And you can see on the hemodynamic assessments that the mean pulmonary pressure was higher than 20 millimeter of mercury with normal post capillary pressure, a low cardiac index for uh, this patient and high level of pulmonary vascular resistance. And this is combined with an elevation of NT pro BNP. So you have in these patients a definitive diagnosis of portopulmonary hypertension with a definition of precapillary pulmonary hypertension associated with intrinsic portal hypertension due to cirrhosis type stage B. So there, are, there is now a major consequence on the management of these patients because the TIPS is contraindicated for this patient because it can, uh, it, it, it can lead to a white heart failure due to the uh, increase in the prelude of the uh, white cavities. And you have to transfer this patient in an expert center to organize a multidisciplinary approach and to treat this pulmonary arterial hypertension. So how to treat uh, the patient with portopulmonary hypertension? The management is based on non-specific therapies and the use of pH-targeted therapies. Regarding the non-specific therapies, this is similar to the other form of pulmonary hypertension with, of course, the, the use of diuretics. If there is volume overload, that it's very frequent in this patient due to the combination of the liver disease and the combination of the pulmonary uh, and the white heart failure. Some patients can have also uh, a, a low oxygenation, and it's also very important to research systematically in these patients a combined hepatopulmonary syndrome because we, are, we can observe uh, the combination of hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension. These two diseases are not opposite, and we can have the combination of both in some patients. The second point is that the beta blockers can be deleterious for the white ventricular function. And we will see that when we stop the beta blockers, we can also improve the hemodynamic of patients, and we can also improve the dyspnea and the six minute wall distance in these patients. So of course, it is a discussion between the pneumologists or cardiologists and the hepatologists, and to discuss the benefit-risk ratio to stop the beta blockers with uh, a program of, of esophageal viruses ligator if necessary. The oral anticoagulation is contraindicated, is not indicated in these patients. Uh, the calcium channel blockers is also not indicated in this patient because there is no acute vasoreactivity in this subtype of pulmonary arterial hypertension, and this treatment can have deleterious effect on the portal hemodynamic. And uh, when you treat a patient for HIV infections, you have to closely follow up these patients because some cases report, uh, reported a, a worsening of the pH, transitions worsening of pH after the treatment of the HIV infections. So regarding the beta blockers, we performed this study uh, more than 10 years ago. We only stop the beta blockers without pH medications. And you can see that we improve the six minutes for distance in these patients. As expected, we increase the heart rate and the cardiac output, but this was also associated with a decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance. So if in the first hemodynamic assessment, patients have normal and high or high cardiac output with a high risk of the fagal viruses rupture, you can continue the beta blockers if necessary. But if patients have severe pulmonary hypertension with low cardiac output, you have to discuss the benefit risk ratio to stop the beta blockers that will contribute to improve the hemodynamic of patients with portopulmonary hypertension. Afterwards, uh, the use of pH therapies. Uh, 
the use of the pH therapy and the first line therapy that we will uh, initiate in these patients will depend on the pH severity, the liver disease severity, and if there is an indication for liver transplantations or not, and the urgency for the liver transplantations according to the severity of the underlying liver disease. You have also to consider that the use of this treatment is in patients with type A stage B or stage C cirrhosis, it is an off-label use of this treatment. And, and that's why you have to introduce this treatment cautiously with a closely follow-up of the hemodynamic of patient, but also the liver function and the complication of portal hypertension after the introduction of pH therapies. Regarding the choice of the treatment, it's also, of course, based on the severity of the pulmonary hypertension at the first assessment. And we uh, use many parameters in combinations to perform a risk stratification of patients mm -hmm. according to the clinical scenes of pulmonary hypertension, according to the biomarker, the echocardiographic parameters, MRI, and hemodynamic in these patients. And we will choose the first line therapy according to the risk stratification of pH and according to the uh, severity of the underlying liver disease. So currently we have three main classes that is used to treat patients with portopulmonary hypertension as in other form of pulmonary arterial hypertension, the endothelin pathway with endothelin receptor antagonisms, the nitric oxide pathway with the use of uh, PD5 inhibitors and the prostacycline pathways that, that is more uh, complicated because uh, these treatments uh, are uh, initiated with intravenous, uh, intravenous or subcutaneous uh, infusion of the treatment. So the last guidelines recommended in these patients to uh, start with an initial monotherapy due to the comorbidity of these patients, followed by sequential combination if necessary, taking into consideration the underlying liver disease and the indication for liver transplantation. In some patients, we will choose to start a combination therapy at first-line therapy but the combination therapy will be used with cautious and with a closely follow-up of the potential complication on the portal hypertension. We have few uh, prospective data about the efficacy and the safety of the use of pH therapies in these specific populations. We have only one randomized clinical trial with the use of macitantin. And in this study, the Portico study, the primary endpoint was the change in the pulmonary vascular resistance three to four months after the initiation of the treatment. And you can see that this study reported a significant reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance by 35% in patients treated with macitantin in comparison with patients treated with placebo. Some of these patients were uh, already treated with PD-5 inhibitors before uh, the uh, inclusion in the study. But in this study, it was not observed a significant improvement in the other hemodynamic parameters and no significant difference between groups in change from baseline to week uh, 12 in six minute full distance. We have now also the experience of the pH registries. Uh, here, I reported the experience of the French registry that is the uh, most important cohort of patients with portopulmonary hypertension with 637 patients that was enrolled in this uh, registry. You can see that 90% uh, of patients received pH therapy during the first year following the diagnosis of POPH. And as expected, the first line therapy was most often an initial monotherapy and PD-5 PD-5 inhibitor was used in more than half of patients because it's easier to use this treatment uh, because there is no liver metabolism. We can also use endothelin receptor antagonists, but uh, this treatment is contraindicated if there is an elevation of liver enzymes more than uh, three uh, uh, comparing to, to the normal uh, level of these uh, enzymes.
We also use an initial double combination therapy in some patients with the combination of PD5 inhibitor and endotelin receptor antagonists. But in contrast, the use of prostacyclines was very rare in this subpopulation of patients because finally we can obtain very interesting data uh, with the oral therapy endotelin receptor antagonists and PD5 inhibitor. So in this study, we also compare the effect of the pulmonary vascular resistance according to the first line therapy. And you can see that we have exactly the same effect with the use of endotelin receptor antagonists and the PD5 inhibitors. And with uh, these two treatments, we decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance in about uh, 40%, like it was observed in the Portico study. And in the real life, in the registry, we also improve the six minute wall distance and we also improve the functional status of patients with an improvement of the dyspnea when we use the pH therapies. As I said just before, you have to use of pH therapy uh, very cautiously and you have to follow up the potential complication at the portal hypertension when, the, when we use this treatment. There is opposite uh, demonstration of the effect of this treatment of the portal circulation. Some experimental studies reported a beneficial effect on the intrahepatic circulations with a decrease in portal pressure by reducing intrahepatic vascular resistance, probably due to antifibrotic effect. But on the other side, you have some clinical experience that reported deleterious effects on splanting circulation due to the vasodilation effect with an increase in the splanting blood flow and a risk of decompensated portal hypertension. So that's why it's very important and more specifically in patients with advanced cirrhosis to closely follow up these patients and to closely follow up that there is no the development of complication on the portal circulation when you introduce the pH therapy. So in our patients, we decided to introduce a monotherapy at first line therapy with a PD-5 inhibitor, the tadalafil. And after what, we perform a new assessment of the pulmonary hypertension. You can see that we obtain in our patient an improvement of the six minute wall distance. And we also improve the hemodynamic data with a decrease in the mean pulmonary pressure, an improvement of the cardiac output, an improvement of the cardiac index. And finally, we obtain, we obtain a decrease in the pulmonary vascular resistance, about 40%. And after what, we closely follow up the patients. And one year later, a pathologist considering that, 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 that these patients had an indication for liver transplantations due to the recurrence of varies, varices uh, bleeding and due to uh, a worsening of the hepatic functions with the male uh, 15. So uh, how manage patients now who have a portal pulmonary hypertension with the indications uh, for liver transplantations. So first, it's important to understand that the POPH can be a contraindication for liver transplantations if there is uh, no hemodynamic assessments that uh, can uh, perform a liver transplantation in uh, safety conditions. In this, uh, this meta-analysis that was performed by uh, Michael Krovka 20 years ago, you can see that if patients have a, a mean pulmonary pressure higher than 50 millimeter of mercury or a mean pulmonary pressure between 35 and 50 millimeter of mercury with PBR higher than three wood units, you have an unacceptable risk of mortality after liver transplantations with a high risk of whiter failure after the liver transplantations. So to more than 20 years ago, when the patients had portopulmonary hypertension, these patients was uh, systematically uh, contraindicated for liver transplantations. But now there is many evolution on the management of these patients, and we will see that we can propose with the use of pH therapies, the liver transplantations due to the efficacy of this treatment before the liver transplantation. So the risk of white heart failure after liver transplantations is due to the dramatic change in the hemodynamic 
uh, during the uh, transplantations, when you perform the hepatectomy, you will suddenly decrease the prelude of the white ventricle, a decrease in the mean, mean pulmonary pressure and cardiac output, especially if there is a total clamping of the uh, IBC. And during the reperfusion time, you will suddenly increase the prelude of the white ventricle you will suddenly increase the mean pulmonary pressure and you can precipitate the white ventricular function. And that's why it's very important to control the pulmonary hypertension uh, before to perform a liver transplantation. This is a risk during the peri and the post-operative period. But we can also observe a transient, transient uh, aggravation of portal portopulmonary hypertension more later during the three to six months following the liver transplantation. And that's why it's very important, even if the patients didn't develop white heart failure just after the liver transplantation, it's very important to closely follow up the patients during this critical period three to six months after the liver transplantation. And we will see after the long-term evolution of the portopulmonary hypertension. So now we never systematically contraindicate the patient for liver transplantation when we diagnose a portopulmonary hypertension during the screening period. Now we propose to use the pH therapies in whole patients in order to achieve a hemodynamic uh, profile that can allow a liver transplantation in safe conditions. And that's why the multidisciplinary approach is very important to manage these patients with the uh, uh, close communication between the liver center and the expert center for the management of pulmonary hypertension. In this study, we uh, observe the effect of the pH therapy in a cohort of patients who were candidate for liver transplantation. And you can find in the literature similar results in other cohort of patients. You can see that only 20% of patients had hemodynamic allowing liver transplantations without the use of pH-specific therapies before the liver transplantations. But in 80% of patients, uh, uh, you had a uh, hemodynamic that contraindicated the liver transplantation. And that's why we propose now to introduce the pH-specific therapies in all these patients. And you can see that we can obtain uh, an improvement of the hemodynamic and we can obtain hemodynamic data allowing the liver transplantation in 70% of these patients after the initiation of pH-specific therapies. So finally, if we return to our clinical case, you can see that these patients have a mean, pulmon mean pulmonary pressure lower than 35 millimeters of mercury after the initiation of tadalafil, and a pulmonary vascular resistance lower than five wood units after the initiation of tadalafil. So before the, tad the initiation of tadalafil, this patient was uh, not able to have a safe liver transplantation. After the introduction of tadalafil, you have now hemodynamic allowing her liver transplantation in uh, safe conditions. But these patients, even if you have hemodynamic criteria allowing the liver transplantation, these patients who keep higher level of pulmonary vascular resistance have a higher risk of mortality in, on the waiting list. And that's why, like in hepatopulmonary syndrome, it's important to decrease the time on the waiting list, to decrease the risk of mortality before the liver transplantations. And in US and other countries in Europe, we can also have mild exception in these patients to prioritize these patients for the liver transplantations after obtaining hemodynamic data, allowing a safe liver transplantation a mean pulmonary pressure lower than 35 millimeter of mercury with PVR lower than five wood units. And if patients have always a mean pulmonary pressure higher than 35 millimeter of mercury, you have to achieve a pulmonary vascular resistance lower than three to four wood units and a good white heart functions.
after you have specific considerations during the liver transplantations. We recommend for these patients who have systematically an invasive monitoring of the hemodynamic just before, during, and just after the liver transplantations to monitor the prelude of the white ventricles, the cardiac function, and to detect very early uh, the development of white heart failure during and just after the procedure to adapt the treatment and to manage these patients like a white heart failure if necessary after and during the liver transplantations. And after, if patients develop a refractory white heart failure, you have to consider the possibility to reinforce the treatment of the portopulmonary hypertension with the expert uh, center that manage uh, the portopulmonary hypertension. As I said before, it's very important not to stop the PS therapies after the liver transplantation. It's very important to continue the treatment after the liver transplantation. And as I said before, these patients can have a transient worsening of the portopulmonary hypertension during the three to six months following the liver transplantation. And that's why we perform, we systematically perform a new hemodynamic assessment at three months after the liver transplantations. And if we have a worsening of the portopulmonary hypertension, it can be necessary to reinforce the treatment in some of these patients. But when we follow up the patients one year after the liver transplantations, you can see that we can obtain with a combination of pH therapy and liver transplantation, we can obtain in some patients a normalization of hemodynamic and some patients we keep moderate or higher level of pulmonary pressure, but after the liver transplantation, there is no more evolution of the pulmonary vascular disease. And when we select the patients, where when we uh, improve the management during the perioperative and the postoperative period, you can see that now the survival of patients who were transplanted for portal hype uh, with a portal pulmonary hypertension, you can see that the survival of this patient is better than patients who were not transplanted uh, with the portal pulmonary hypertension. But it's very uh, difficult today to have predictive factors of normalization of pulmonary pressure at distance of the liver transplantations. And this result was also observed in this meta-analysis, and it was concluded in this meta-analysis that the uh, uh, treatment and liver transplantations confers better prognosis than pH therapies alone, but in selected patients. So today, we will come, we, there is no clear indication for liver transplantation in all patients with portopulmonary hypertension. It's clearly different than hepatopulmonary hyper, uh, hypertension. But you have to consider the transplantation if the POPH is managed, if hemodynamic assessments can uh, produce safe conditions for liver transplantation if there is advanced cirrhosis. And the question for the future is to uh, detect patients who could benefit uh, of a, a liver transplantation early in the course of the liver disease uh, to uh, improve the pulmonary vascular condition and the hepatic condition. To conclude, patients evaluated for liver transplantation of TIPS and patients who present with dyspnea should be screened for POPH. Screening is performed by measuring the tricuspid regurgitation velocity. In case of suspicion of POPH, white heart gas is always mandatory to have a definitive diagnosis of POPH. This patient should be managed in a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, in these patients, we can use the pH therapies, but cautiously. And if there is an hepatic indication, liver transplantation may be indicated in strictly selected patients. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, so we uh, had very two useful talks and they are especially useful uh, for our fellows
uh, who are uh, working in the hepatology departments and the gastroenterology departments and managing cases of end stage uh, liver disease. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Valentine and Professor uh, Lorraine. Yeah, so uh, uh, we'll uh, start our discussion. And uh, so I, I would like to know what is the, uh, how common is the coexistence of uh, uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension? Because these are the two conditions uh, that uh, may coexist and we have to look for both conditions in our transplant candidates. So what is the frequency and uh, what precautions should we use and what criteria should we follow when uh, these both conditions are coexisting? So anyone? Uh... So uh, when we screen systematically uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome in patients with portopulmonary hypertension, we have in our experience a prevalence around 25% of patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome. And uh, only one uh, previous study reported higher prevalence, higher than uh, 50%. Uh, uh, one question is the effect of the uh, pH therapies on the gas exchange in these patients, because these treatments have a vasodilatation effect. And uh, it was reported that we can uh, uh, was the gas exchange in these patients who combine hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension. But it's not so clear. And uh, it's clear when we treat a patient with portopulmonary hypertension, you have also uh, to closely follow up the gas exchange. And if there is a worsening of the gas exchange, you have to screen also the hepatopulmonary syndrome. And if patients have hepatopulmonary syndrome combined with portopulmonary hypertension, you can also discuss an indication for liver transplantation due to the combination of the two pulmonary vascular diseases, I think. So, uh, and Professor Fermi? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I would to... agree to, to uh, Professor Weil. Um, I just want to mention, um, if you have the rare condition of a combination of both, both presence, which is unusual as in hepatopulmonary syndrome, as Professor Weil presented, you have an uh, HPS, you have a decreased interpulmonary vascular resistance and in portopulmonary hypertension, you have an increased uh, interpulmonary resistance. If you have both circumstances together, I think the only consequence from an HPS point of view is to, apart from evaluation, liver transplantation, okay, um, is to initiate uh, supplemental oxygen therapy. And I assume in okay. portopulmonary hypertension, you have also the cutoff of 60 millimeters of mercury. And that's when you start uh, also in portopulmonary hypertension, long-term oxygen therapy. I hope I'm right, Professor Savari. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I ask one question to Professor Valentin Fermin? Uh, Professor Fermin, uh, uh, nice talk uh, on uh, for, uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. You mentioned about intrapulmonary uh, vascular dilatations, and also you mentioned about the AV shunts. So uh, not all the patients have AV shunts. Some of these patients will be having only uh, vascular dilatations. Is it true? Sorry, I just didn't. Uh, can I repeat the question? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was uh, just asking. Uh, in uh, uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome, there is uh, intrapulmonary vascular dilatation. And some patients have the shunts also, AV shunts in the lungs. So is it possible to differentiate clinically uh, what uh, number of patients would be having only dilatation? And uh, uh, some of the patients would be having shunts. Can we distinguish these two categories mm -hmm. of patients? Yeah. Um, it's, it's an, an interesting question and also kind of difficult question because I always think what may be the consequence. Usually, hepatopulmonary syndrome is the combination of intrapulmonary vascular dilatation, presence of intrapulmonary shunts, and then ventilation diffusion, diffusion mismatch. That's always the combination. You have also to charge what's the main issue. Um, <coughs> personally, I 
perform um uh, also an, an CT scan for uh, screening for selective uh, large intrapulmonary shunts in patients with advanced hepatopulmonary syndrome. And then I, 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 we can consider if there is an opportunity to, to perform a uh, localizable uh, coil embolization, but it's in very, very rare circumstance. But I, I personally do this only in patients with severe hepatopulmonary syndrome. That means PO2 below 60 meters of mercury. We do not use routinely and CT scan in every patient with a uh, diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome. That's my personal approach to this difficult situation. So can we clinically suspect from the examination of the patient uh, that this patient would be having uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome in addition to you mentioned about pelatopnia, and uh, orthodoxia, and uh, are there any other ways that uh, we may distinguish these patients who would be having significant hepatopulmonary syndrome? We can, we can look for clinical signs like digital clubbing, uh, uh, but, but that, that, that's not specific for hepatopulmonary syndrome. There's only a sign of chronic hypoxemia. And um, um, so we have really to actively screen these patients by pulmonary function testing, arterial blockers analysis, and contrast-enhanced echocardiography. That's the only uh, way to diagnose and to identify these patients properly. So, some of the papers show that if you have the spider nevi, then maybe that uh, this patient may be prone to have because the similar process is ongoing uh, I agree elsewhere that, in the body as well. I agree. There are some reports that the number of spider nevi is increased mm -hmm. in patients with hepatopulmonary syndrome, but it's not as, uh, as totally specific sign. So, so this is also present in some patients without HPS. It may suggest this, but we have to actively screen by blockers analysis and contrast intense echocardiography. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I continue with my next uh, query, because severe hypoxemia may persist even after liver transplant, and this is true for hepatopulmonary syndrome, as, as reflected in your talk, and also reflected uh, in talk uh, by Professor Lauren about uh, portopulmonary hypertension. So what should be the approach? Should we continue with the oxygen therapy? in these patients uh, or uh, like uh, Professor Sewell mentioned that uh, we have to uh, consider other therapies uh, uh, like uh, 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 Tadalafil or uh, similar drugs. So in, in hepatopulmonary syndrome, usually following liver transplantation, the immediate situation remains quite stable. So usually the patient has still the necessity of supplemental oxygen therapy and, and um, 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 hypoxemia for several weeks and months after liver transplantation. In a good case, the, the, the respiratory impairment and the interpulmonary vascular dilatation declines and regresses after several months. This is not an immediate change of the setting. Uh, however, there may be some people, uh, some patients, many risk factors, severe hypoxemia below 50 millimeters of mercury PO2 and significantly increased intrapulmonary shunting more than 20%. This have increased risk for severe hypoxemic respiratory failure <clears throat> following liver transplantation. And in these patients, the main therapeutic aspects have to be judged on an individualized basis. There are some reports that even uh, uh, administration of inhalative nitrogen Oxy, uh, oxid uh, improved oxygenation, but mainly the most reports incorporate ECMO uh, as a potential useful tool that may uh, help uh, to, to bridge the severe condition uh, and the average duration was approximately two weeks after liver transplantation that ECMO was necessary with a quite surprisingly high rate of su successful weaning from ECMO and survival rates of more than 80% according to the literature of 17 case reports. Yeah. Professor Sewell, would you like to add something in addition, uh, whatever said? Uh, uh, regarding the portal pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, uh, after, yes. after liver transplant, yeah. If the after patient has got the both, both problems, hepatopulmonary syndrome and portal pulmonary mm -hmm. hypertension pre-transplant and post transplant uh, would management uh, would differ uh, in any case or not 
Now for for patient with pulmonary hypertension, if you have uh, hypoxemia, you have also to introduce supplement oxygenation, of course, but the mechanisms are, are not the same and all patients have not uh, gas exchange abnormalities. Uh, uh, so it, it, as I said before, if you have severe hypoxemia in patient with pulmonary hypertension, you have to screen the combination of both. Uh, more important is the management of pulmonary hypertension after liver transplant. And, and the main message for the pathologies is that the, the pH-specific therapy have to be continued after the liver transplantations. Uh, and more specifically, during the critical period that between three to six months after the liver transplantation. It's very important not to stop the treatment because if you stop, you have a risk of right heart failure after the liver transplantations. But at distance, more than six months after the liver transplantations, we can observe dramatic improvement of portopulmonary hypertension. And only in these cases, you can consider a, a decrease in the pH therapies. And some patients were withdrawn for from all pH therapies, but this decision must be discussed with the expert in pulmonary hypertension and after hemodynamic assessment, functional assessment of patients. Uh, 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 professor uh, Seven, you mentioned about uh, poro B and B, uh, meteoritic uh, uh, factor. Uh, so uh, can we take this as surrogate marker of the uh, uh, pulmonary portal pulmonary hypertension in our patients if the poro bnp is uh, elevated and uh, does uh, because in your case this was elevated so i'm just asking that yes and tpro bnp uh, can be a biomarker for of right ventricular dysfunction and uh, i think that when we observe a high level of tpro bnp in your patient with uh, cirrhosis uh, I think that it can be indicated to, to perform a, a echocardiography in these patients to, to screen left or right heart uh, failure and to screen pulmonary hypertension. So, uh, Professor Hesmik, I can see that you are anxiously waiting to ask some questions. Yes, uh, so, yeah. I have some uh, two questions to two speakers. So, uh, of course, prevention is better than uh, a good uh, even treatment. Uh, anyway, my question is any biomarkers, any predictors or subgroups of cirrhotic patients as a high risk for uh, development of uh, both uh, syndromes. Uh, next, my questions, uh, the etiology of cirrhosis and association with the severity of uh, both syndromes. Thank you. I can you. I can start with the uh, portopulmonary hypertension if you, if you want. Uh, there is no clear etiology of cirrhosis that is associated with a higher risk to develop portopulmonary hypertension. It was only mentioned in one study uh, uh, over representation of patients with autoimmune disease, uh, liver disease, perhaps because autoimmunity can also participate to the pathophysiology of pulmonary arterial hypertension. But globally, we have the same, the same distribution of the etiologies of, of liver disease in this patient. And as I uh, mentioned in, in my slide, uh, portopulmonary hypertension is not clearly associated with the severity of the liver disease. In our court of patients, 60 to 70 percent of patients have a cirrhosis hyper stage A or a next hepatic uh, portal hypertension. So all the condition, all the severity of liver disease can induce portopulmonary hypertension, and uh, and and it's not the cirrhosis the trigger of the development of both PUPH and HPH. It the porto uh, porto uh, systemic communications due to extrahepatic or intrahepatic portal hypertension that can induce these uh, pulmonary circulation disorders. Uh, 
I think it's quite comparable from the hepatopulmonary syndrome's point of view. Um, the slightly discrepant data from the US and from Europe, mainly from Vienna, where we did a lot of research. In Vienna, we observed HPS more prevalent in advanced stages of cirrhosis. In the US, it was the opposite uh, way that they observed it more frequently in early stages. It may be also in, uh, contributed due to the different approach of screening patients. We mainly screened the patients in hospital in VARD and the Americans that time I talked to Mike Fallon, uh, they screened mainly the outpatient clinic patients. So this may be my opinion, the personal main difference regarding the underlying uh, cause of cirrhosis. We also did not observe any specific uh, correlations between, for instance, alcoholic liver disease and hepatopulmonary syndrome that's independent of the cause of cirrhosis also in HPS. But however, the severity of HPS seemed to be totally independently from the stage of uh, severity of cirrhosis. So we have the, the most severe patient I remember was uh, with PO2 of 35 millimeters of mercury, child a cirrhotic patient, but we also observed severe hypoxemia in advanced stages of liver disease. So there's no so, clear so correlation. Are, are there any genetic factors or any genes that are involved? There are some some studies uh, 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 some studies regarding regarding uh, uh, genetic prep, uh, association regarding uh, angiogenetic factors in hepatopulmonary syndrome regarding from Willebrand factor for instance. But um, we, we did one study uh, uh, for uh, for uh, screening biomarkers that may be uh, helpful for detection of hepatopulmonary syndrome. We observed a quite good correlation with from this from Willebrand factor that was confirmed by a recent American study in combination with uh, angiogenetic factors, but it's still not a solid tool that can be used routinely for all patients. So I think for hepatopulmonary we still have to perform tyrol placas analysis, assessment of intrapulmonary shunting by contrasting sense echocardiography. Biomarkers can support this approach, but there's no valid biomarker that proves this is hepatopulmonary syndrome only by assessment of one biomarker. Yet. Thank you. Uh, Professor, Professor may I ask one question to Dr. Lauren? Uh, thank you very much for both uh, speakers. They are excellent, uh, really, talks. Uh, my question is uh, many of the uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome uh, patients uh, are the candidates for the uh, liver transplantation. And uh, the patient, has uh, more than 50 millimeter uh, mercury of PAP. Is that the absolute contraindication for the uh, liver transplantation or do you need some other criteria? No, you have not to use only this criteria. Uh, first, even if you have a mean pulmonary pressure at the first assessment, you have not to contraindicate this patient at first assessment. As I said, you have to use pH therapies uh, to obtain hemodynamic data that can uh, allow a safe transplantation. Uh, with the pH therapies, it's very rare to have patients who keep a mean pulmonary pressure higher than 50 millimeter of mercury. In most severe patients, we use combination therapy in order to obtain hemodynamic data allowing liver transplantation. But if after a maximal pH therapy, you have always a mean pulmonary pressure higher than 50 millimeter of mercury, you have to consider that there is a definitive contraindication for liver transplantation. But of, on, uh, of course, it's not the only parameter uh, to assess and to decide, okay? Generally, when you have a mean pulmonary uh, pressure higher than 50 millimeter of mercury, you have very high level of pulmonary vascular resistance, you have wide ventricular dysfunction, and, and generally it's a, it's a definitive contraindication. In patients with mean pulmonary pressure lower than 35 millimeter of mercury, generally you have a low level of pulmonary vascular resistance, you have good parameters of the white ventricular function, and it's okay. The most difficult is with patients with mean pulmonary pressure between 35 to 50 millimeters of mercury. Some of these patients have elevations of pulmonary pressure that is also due 
to the persistence of high cardiac output. And finally, these patients have no high level of pulmonary vascular resistance. And you know that just after the liver transplantation, the high cardiac output will decrease and the mean pulmonary pressure will decrease. And if these patients have a good weight out function, I, I, I think that it's possible to perform the liver transplantations. But if patients have a mean pulmonary pressure between 35 and 50 milliliters of mercury, be, but with normal of low level of cardiac output in these patients who will have higher level of pulmonary vascular resistance. And for these patients, it's not reasonable to, to perform the liver transplantation. But you can use combination therapy. And finally, when we use combination therapy, generally in 70 to 80 percent of patients, uh, we obtain the hemodynamic criteria allowing the liver transplantation now. And that's why we dramatically improve the prognosis of this patient. Thank you. Uh, may I ask one question again uh, to Professor Lauren Seville? Uh, uh, Professor, uh, uh, we talk a lot about idiopathic uh, pulmonary hypertension. And uh, less about portal pulmonary hypertension. So uh, when uh, we deal with uh, portal pulmonary hypertension and compare the management with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, what are the do's and don'ts, uh, especially when we are treating portal pulmonary hypertension? Does the management differ from the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension or not? Uh, yes, it, 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 it can be different. Uh, first, uh, in idiopathic pH now, in most patients, we introduce combination therapy at first-line therapy, uh, oral combination therapy or triple combination therapy with the use of IV prostacycline. In patients with cirrhosis, when you have a mild cirrhosis, childbirth stage A, I think that you can manage these patients like idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. But in patients with more severe cirrhosis, uh, it's, uh, you have to introduce the treatment uh, more cautiously, and you start with a monotherapy, and after you add a combination therapy, if you didn't if, if you uh, have no the hemodynamic data uh, that, that uh, can uh, allow uh, the liver transplantation. So we start with monotherapy, we closely follow up the patient, and after we had another therapy, if it's not sufficient to have hemodynamic criteria allowing liver transplantation. So it's quite different in idiopathic pH combination therapy for all patients now in the recommendation in patients with cirrhosis, monotherapy, and after sequential combination therapy, according to the evolution of the hemodynamic and the liver condition. You mentioned about avoiding beta blockers in these uh, patients. So what about the calcium channel blockers? Uh, I think you mentioned about that also. Again, uh, so. Any role of calcium channel blockers in portal pulmonary hypertension? So beta blockers? Uh, beta that... blockers should be avoided, like you mentioned. Any role of calcium channel blockers? No. Uh, beta blockers, uh, some of patients have beta blockers for the prevention of uh, esophageal varices rupture. Uh, when we have a diagnosis of POPH and patient is treated with beta blockers, we discuss with the pathologies according to the severity of the hemodynamic data if we can stop the beta blockers, okay? The calcium channel blockers, there is no indication for the use of this treatment. This treatment is only used in patients with idiopathic pH who have a vaso acute vasoreactivity. It's a clear definition during the first assessment of pH. But in patients with pH associated with conditions, including cirrhosis, there is no acute response to uh, vasoreactivity. And that's why there is never indications to start calcium channel blockers in patients with portopulmonary hypertension. It will be deleterious for the patients. Uh, 
professor hasmik uh, any more questions uh, no, thank otherwise you. we may thank you yeah. thank you let us finish okay so it, it remains my duty to thank both the speakers and we learned a lot uh, from both talks and these talks helped us and our gi fellows and hepatology fellows uh, to uh, because there were many doubts and many things that were not clear because we do not talk much until unless we are working in the liver transplant center about uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension so we learned a lot from both of the talks uh, and thank you very much uh, professor lauren Sevel and uh, Professor Valentin uh, Furman and uh, all the panelists and all the attendees that they spared their time and joined us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much for the invitation. Thank you. See you, Taipei. Hi. Don't wait to say Abbas. How are you? <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maida. Yes, great. Thanks. Wonderful. It's snowing in Tokyo, so I got to leave. Thank you very much. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Hasumi. <laughs> yes. Oromechi. Nice. Great. Thank you. Right. Bye bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kadir and Oromechi. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.